Welcome to High Elevation, episode one. Uh, these are your hosts, Alex Feinberg and my man. Jungle Jay here. Credit to Alex Feinberg for the name on Jungle Jay. Charles J. Alzatine officially, according to the U.S. government. So pumped to be here on the High Elevation podcast, episode one. My man, Alex, this is going to be a blast. Yeah, well, Jay, so, you know, I think the, the theme of this podcast is going to be high performance, but also... Uh, you know, alternative approaches to high performance. And uh, you've had a great 2022. A lot of people have had challenging 2022s. Economies ticking downwards, stock markets crashing downwards, crypto markets getting devastated. But uh, Jay Azeltine, Juggle Jay stock is, uh, is going through the roof. Stock's higher than ever, man. And so, you know, it's a, it's a recurring theme. Same for you, Alex. I think you mm -hmm. could say the same thing. This has probably been the best year of your Correct. life up until this point. And it really had started in 2020, it seems, right? For mm -hmm. for me, for you, for Zach, really everyone I feel like in our tribe has thrived since 2020, right? And, I, and, and that's that's because we're conspiracy theorists. If you, if you actually want to get to the bottom of it, and uh, you know, I've said this multiple times, where one of the best indicators of your socioeconomic class is what COVID did to you or what COVID did for you. Ooh. And I think that... A bunch of the people in our circle who are typically, you know, younger, healthy men, younger, healthy, entrepreneurship oriented men uh, are almost all better off. And, uh, you know, I'll share my story because I became a full time entrepreneur after you did. I'm 36 years old. It took me a while to uh, to rip the corporate bandaid off, probably because I was making a good amount of money um, to not necessarily, you know, break. And so how, long, how long have you been? How long have you been self-employed? Share with the people. Since May of 2021. So let's see, May, June, July, August, September is closing in on my 17th month um, doing it, doing it full time. And, um, you know, last, last year, the back half of the year, I probably made about 80% of what I was making um, with my full time job. And then this year, I'll probably make closer to 90% of what I was making with um, my full time job. And, uh, you know, next year, I think if things keep going well, I could probably eclipse it and pass it. And, uh, you know, th that's a healthy income that I was leaving, uh, working at a cryptocurrency exchange after spending six years at Google. So, you know, I think my, even though I don't have wife and kids at the moment, uh, you know, my, uh, my income needs uh, are higher than say they were when I was 24 years old. And so, um, but, you know, none of, none of this would have happened if the entire economy didn't shut down thanks to COVID. And none of it would have happened if, I or you or any of us decided that we were going to stay inside and close ourselves off to social and economic opportunities uh, to listen to, you know, what uh, people were trying to scare us with. You know, I think you're probably fairly, fairly similar to me in this regard where, you know, in the beginning, I didn't want to be stupid. I didn't want to expose myself to unnecessary risks. We didn't even know what we were dealing with. Um, at the same time, I wasn't going to not live my life. I, I realized that you know, even if I did get COVID, which I didn't want to get, number one, I was probably going to get it no matter what at some point. And so, you know, all I could do is just like not make out with ugly chicks at bars. I'm like, let me, yeah. let me, let me take it. The, the dumbest things I could possibly do that would expose me to COVID and not do those. Sure. And then I'm going to live my life outside. Well, you know what, you know, it's interesting for me, sorry, not to cut you off, but in 2020, March of 2020, I blew my knee out. Right. So you can still see the, you can see the scar here. Well, that was in March. I thought that was in the winter for some reason. That was so it's still technically winter. Um, it was in the mountains of Idaho, so it was snowy, but it was okay. March of 2020, right? Got so it. my knee, my knee exploded, ends up on the side of my leg. Like, fuck, my training's over now. This, this is not good, right? This whole, and I'd love to share that story on a, on a different podcast, but a moment of of acceptance and gratitude in that moment, and that ultimately then shot me into COVID, right? Like that yeah. was right when COVID was beginning, and so I had no option but to be on my couch, laid up with my feet elevated and an immobilizer with my knee. And literally I spent that whole year just focused on my business and on my computer, just growing. You know what I mean? Like literally I had no option, which was awesome, but I was on so my couch the whole time. At that point in 2020, was your business online training or you hadn't done the online training? I started, stuff? I started, so I started my business seven years ago. It's, it's, it's reinvented itself many times now over the last seven years, but it started seven years ago with online fitness health, coaching basically, right? Yeah. It was training, it was nutrition, basic stuff. And so in 2020, at the beginning of 2020, I launched a high ticket coaching program for the first time, right? I joined Wake Up Wealthy a year and a half prior, had this network of really strong 
entrepreneurs, young male entrepreneurs that had money and were seeking some like higher level biohacking, like full life optimization coaching, right? And so I transitioned from low ticket coaching in January of 2020 to that higher ticket model that was more well-rounded coaching. And that was when Max and I kind of joined forces in, mm -hmm. in February, March of 2020, and we launched Entreperform. So I was just beginning a new company at the beginning of 2020 and a blown knee to go into the year. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a, that's a lot to, to put on anybody's plate. And what was your backup plan? Man, I don't have backup plans, bro. Yeah, so, I don't. So, so tell me, like when you blew your knee out, how much money did you have in the bank? At that time, I don't know, maybe fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. And then okay, so and, and I had and I had a, a good bit of equity built up in my house too. So like, but I, I would never thought I, my brain doesn't work that way, dude. I could have had zero dollars in the bank and it wouldn't have mattered. Like I wouldn't have stressed at all like because i have been there i have been there over the last couple of years even with ebbs and flows of business where i was close to to nothing you know what i mean with with debt running up on, on the business side and like mm -hmm. i just don't care because I, I i trust in myself and i know long term where i'm gonna be so the short term just doesn't matter to me you know what i mean i i know from talking to you that's true but you have to fight internal battles i'm sure because totally every, everybody has self-doubt right so for, you know sure. at, some, at some level you're like hey i didn't sell anything today and i still needed to eat and buy food so my savings are down <laughs> and that's, a, this, and that's a, this happened two days in a row now what's going on <laughs> and, and that's a real thing too but honestly like again i never had a plan b like i definitely feel that resistance just as much as anyone or more than anyone and that doubt comes up that 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 you know there's limiting beliefs that that smaller self the lower self but I never have plan B's. I've never had a plan B since I went in business seven years ago, man. I've stressed a lot about money and business and stuff, but never have I had a plan B. So let's talk through that for, you know, for our listening audience, because a lot of the people, you know, they see us now, everybody who's, who's following us is following us, you know, by definition. So, you know, to them, we're internet personalities, some of them have met us in person, but most of them haven't, right? And so they see what we're doing. It's different from what they're doing usually. And so that's, that's interesting to them. And then they'll also think, well, you know, they're very lucky to, to be where they are. Probably a majority of people who might want to be doing something similar to us uh, are coming up with reasons to explain to themselves why they can't do it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think that it's obvious necessarily to everybody in our listening audience that your mindset was self-made. You know, you didn't, you didn't roll out of bed seven years ago and decide like, okay, I'm, yeah, I'm just going to go do this. I mean, you did, but there were a lot of obstacles in your mind that I'm sure told you, well, don't do that. You know, you can play it a little safer. So like, let's talk through the process for how did you build your tolerance to discomfort? Man, I, I kind of like Bane, dude, I, I was born in the darkness. I feel like, you know what I mean? Like I, I went through some serious childhood trauma around seven, eight years old that, and I shared this in my keynote. And Alex, you were there for my keynote. I don't go too in depth on that story yet. I'll share more of it one day, but it, it shook my reality, man. At eight years old, it it was it was it was so aggressive. It was just such trauma that it, it just shook my reality, and it sent me into a spiral at eight, nine, ten years old of deep depression and anxiety. And so, I, my whole childhood, my whole teenage years were discomfort. You know what I mean? I was constantly in discomfort, and it was constant anxiety, it was constant fear. Mm -hmm. And so, as time went on, and eventually. At 16, 17 years old, I found the Joe Rogan podcast in the year 2010. I met my first mentor, Corey G, co-founded this massive company called Muscle Farm, more successful than anyone I had ever met. Through those guys, I was introduced to personal development. And through personal development, I realized that, oh man, like this is actually a blessing. All that pain that I've gone through in my life, all of that hurt, all of that discomfort, man, that could actually be used for, for good and positive if I can just shift my mindset around it a little bit. And then I kind of got the key. And you realized like, you, you, you had this perspective at 16 years old, 16, 17. I don't know the exact yeah. timing, but it, yeah. and I have journal entries too, from a whole long, the whole way, man, I have journal entries throughout the entire process. And so I kind of got the keys on like, here's how I can heal myself. Here's kind of a blueprint on how I can start to work through these traumas that I went through this, this hurt, this pain that's stored really deeply within me. That's how I found ayahuasca at 16. And I was like, Oh, like that's a tool one day that I will use. And I had this mm -hmm. divine moment. And I just started going down that path. At 18, my, my social anxiety was at its peak, dude. High school graduation day, 18 years old. I had my first, like, I'd had many panic attacks up until that point, especially when I would have to go speak in front of the class for, for you know, some sort of presentation in school throughout my, you know, entire history. But this day was different, man. Like, I had a 
full blown two hour panic attack at high school graduation. I, 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 a lot of it's blacked out, but I remember just like spinning, man. And I'm just like dripping sweat and people are looking at me like, are you okay, bro? I'm like, yeah. I'm and, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and you know me, dude, the whole time I'm smiling. Like I, that smile never left my face. Externally, people were like, you know, this, we must be fine. But internally, I was hurting. And so long story short, that whole, I, I go through that panic attack. Our house burns down that summer, more pain. I move away to college a month and a half later. And I'm really close to my parents at the time. I moved to college. This girlfriend that I was dating, one of my first girlfriends, breaks up with me like the first week of college. I can't go into the cafeteria without having a full-blown panic attack. I can't walk into the classrooms without having a panic attack. I'm having separation from my parents and my family. And I end up dropping out after a week because I went home. I broke my wrist. Whole different story. But long story short, man, my whole buildup was just pain, 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 discomfort, discomfort, Mm -hmm. discomfort. And then I finally started to get ahead of it, right? Like over the last, I moved to Indianapolis to work with Zach Hummel in 20. 2017. And that was like a big step for me of just like starting to get ahead of, it's kind of like this I'm pushing up a, a mountain, right? I'm pushing a boulder right. up a mountain. I'm finally starting to get towards the top. And and since Indy, the last five years, I'd say I, the thing's starting to roll now, right? And it's leading mm-hmm. into keynote speaking and I'm, you know, crushing in business and like the, the impact's growing, the brand's growing, but it started to answer your question in a long winded way through living through a lot of pain throughout my early years. And that's very similar to how I've developed the perspectives that I have, uh, which maybe I don't go into too. I mean, I don't shy away from talking about it, but I I haven't, I guess, gone in in deep detail online about the stress that I went through as a division one athlete. And so, you know, for me, I wasn't a naturally gifted athlete the way most scholarship recipients were, right? I had to, uh, prove myself at every level in order to get the chance to play at the, the following level. It was never obvious to my high school coaches when I was a freshman that I was going to play in college. And it wasn't obvious to my college coaches that I was going to play professionally. And so I wanted to stand out, right? Because, you know, I didn't have great social skills growing up as a, you know, as a aggressive male, uh, you want to stand out. You want to be known for something positive, And I had been good at sports when I was a small child. And so I decided I'm going to put the effort in to be as good at this thing as I was when I was a small kid, because I think I can, uh, you know, regain that skill and I can make something of it. And that seemed, you know, that was a little bit ridiculous for me at the time as a five, 950 pound slow and weak freshman in high school. But I had that North Star where I'm just going to work to be the strongest and fastest player I can possibly be, throw the, throw as hard as I can and play as cocky as I can play in front of as many scouts to increase the amount of scholarship offers that I have and increase my, my draft status. And, uh, you know, you try to set your sights for the, the stars, you end up falling short, you don't get drafted as a, out of high school, but you get a college scholarship. Great. Okay, so I have a scholarship to play in college. Everybody in my community knows me as the scholarship athlete. I'm playing in an SEC school. I'm starting as a freshman. And I I feel like I have the weight of the the world on my shoulders, where it's very obvious at the age of 18, 19 years old when I failed. Anybody who I grew up with in high school or anybody who I went to college with could look in the newspaper and figure out if I embarrassed myself the previous day, previous night. Every time I would do something negative, not only would I get negative responses from coaches, possibly teammates, definitely the fans. And so, you know, very early on in my college career, uh, I developed a tremendous fear of failure. Uh, all of my, all of my failures were public, right? So most people have the luxury of when they fail, they fail privately. I did not have that luxury as a division one athlete. All my failure was public. And I realized after multiple years of playing at the division one level that um, my happiness and my set, my set, sense of validation came from third parties, came from the fans, came from my teammates, came from my coaches. And I realized that that put me in an emotionally vulnerable position where if I were to judge my own success through the eyes of other people, then I would have to internalize their emotional states. And if they're emotionally unstable, then I was going to become emotionally unstable. I was going to stay emotionally unstable while I had uh, a laundry list of challenging items to to execute in front of me. And I knew that that was no way to live life. Not only was that no way to live life at 18, 19, 20 years old, 
it was no way for me to want to live life as an adult. I never wanted to be dependent on a corporation to tell me I did a good job so I could get paid more money, right? I, I realized at 19, 20 years old that male, you know, male to male relationships in adulthood often have a dominant and a subordinate figure. And you don't want to be in too many subordinate positions if you don't trust the person who's in the dominant position. And most people in dominant positions will not act in your best interest. So I had a lot more anxiety than the average 21, 22 years old. Couple that with the fact that I worked for a legitimate conspiracy theorist for my first job out of baseball. You know, I, at 22, 23 years old, I'm hyper paranoid about who's trying to take advantage of me, what corporations are trying to take advantage of me, what banks are trying to take advantage of us. And, uh, you know, most people aren't actually able to navigate the world with that type of worldview because it's too stressful. Right. You, you think through how are all these people and how are all these situations trying to take advantage of me? OK, how can I avoid being taken advantage of? And ultimately, it resulted in the need to build my own value independent of any system. And that value came first in the form of being in good physical shape. But secondly, came in the form of developing an income stream independent of a corporation, because you know, these two things were the only ideas that I had that would enable me to insulate myself from being dependent on third parties that I knew through my life experience were not to be trusted. That's interesting, man. That's that's fascinating to me because our stories are so similar, but so different. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine, because for me, I didn't really start to, to learn about like the way the world actually works until 2020, 2021, you know what I mean? The last mm -hmm. couple of years. So I was really ignorant growing up, which ignorance can be bliss sometimes, you know, and and, and for you, at such a young age, being introduced to that, I, I'm sure it was stressful. I'm sure it was it was it was tough to like. I mean, your entire reality was probably shook, right? Like before you met that guy, did you have any kind of like were you tapped in at all no. to kind of the? You were totally ignorant. I mean, I wasn't totally ignorant. Like you know, you look at the the Kennedy assassination, and you're like, yeah, that doesn't that explanation doesn't make sense. I'm pretty sure he didn't die from a magic bullet shot where the bullet went like that from behind and, you know, so you could tell that, all right, whatever happened with Kennedy was probably a little bit weird, but you, I didn't go into any deep rabbit holes. It was more like, well, I don't think Lee Harvey Oswald was the only person who was involved in the Kennedy assassination, but whatever, like I didn't, I didn't think through anything deeper than that. And it wasn't until the boss I had in Hong Kong tuned me into the formation of the federal reserve where I studied both the uh, the history of the Federal Reserve as well as the history of major industrialist and banking family in the United States. And uh, I came to realize that a lot of history, as we were taught in high school and college, was fake, right? And a, a lot of the reasons why we entered into wars uh, were based on lies to protect the wealthiest interests in the United States. And uh, that's been, in, that has existed for 100 years and it continues to exist. And the people who are representing you are, are, they want your vote, but they also want to be placed in power by people who are funding their campaigns. And, you know, once you realize that a lot of the politicians that you vote for are actually puppets and serve a, a higher interest than their constituency, uh, you know, then you really start to think, okay, well, like, wh what am I getting myself into? Like this, this, uh, this being an adult is very different from what most people think. So whatever it is that most people do, I'm going to think very hard about if that makes, if that path makes sense for me. And so what that meant in corporate America was I never really tried hard to get promoted, right? Because I always wanted to maximize my negotiating leverage, right? And, and I wasn't going to maximize my negotiating leverage if I just did whatever the company wanted to so they would promote me. I would maximize my negotiating leverage by staying in good shape, keeping my you know, ear to the floor, figuring out where the opportunities in the tech industry lay and pursuing those. And so ultimately when I left Google, you know, I had been promoted two times in six years. I think most good employees will get promoted three times in six years, but I just wasn't going to let them dangle that carrot in front of me and manipulate me into jumping for it. I was going to maintain my sovereignty. I probably only missed out on like $50,000 worth of wages over six years. Like it wasn't that big of a deal to maintain my independence, but then I made it back the next year because I negotiated a fifty thousand dollars raise when I, when I uh, joined the crypto space, um, and having left Google, you know, prior to negotiating that offer. And so, you know, in my life experience, working to build 
your transfer value, your negotiating value has always been a better move than trying to placate your boss, trying to make your boss happy with you. And I think a lot of people can't break free of this, you know, master servant type relationship. Oh, if I please the master enough, he'll take care of me. It's like rarely, sometimes that happens, but rarely, most of the time you just stay a servant. And so if you really want to be successful as a servant, you need to figure out how to replace your master, not please your master. Mm. And it starts with developing yourself, right? It literally yeah. starts with with developing yourself. I want you to rewind and, and share kind of like a little bit more about your story because you have such an interesting story. And I want, there's I'm sure a lot of listeners here that don't know your story and give them, give you more credibility, right? So you have this incredibly fascinating story of, you mentioned a little bit about being a D1 athlete and baseball player and then going and working with this billionaire crypto conspir- conspiracy theorist, right? And he taught you all these incredible things. And then you go and work at Google and then you're at another, you're at a crypto exchange and now you're self-employed. So I think it'd be great, obviously be in episode one, if you could give like a little bit of an overview of, of your whole journey. I know you've given a little yeah. bit of bits and pieces here. That would be great. Yeah. So wanting to stand out as a kid, as I mentioned, at 15, 16 years old, I didn't know about entrepreneurship. Like, yeah, I knew Jay-Z and Puff Daddy were entrepreneurs, but like, I didn't know that you could make money outside of sports or entertainment. I thought at 15, 16 years old, there's two paths in life. You can either be a successful athlete or entertainer, or you can work 40 hours a week for $60,000 a year wearing khakis. Like what did your parents do? What, what kind of work did your parents do? Uh, my mom ran a 501c3 and my dad was an attorney. And so, you know, every morning they're waking up at 730 and they're getting ready to go to work. And so that's just what I thought. You know, my dad would leave at eight and come back at six. And we always had food. We never had anything great. You know, we never did like any fancy vacations or anything like that. And so I wanted more, you know, I, I wanted, I actually wanted the ability to not work. Right. I wanted the ability to like sleep in and not do what he had to do from eight to six o'clock every day. And so at the age of 15, 16 years old, I thought, well, the easiest way for me to not work is to get really good at baseball. So I don't have to work like, you know, for 20, 30 years. And so I put all this effort in to develop myself as an athlete, but I had a lower ceiling than a lot of my peers. And so that forced me to uh, create neural pathways to manage stress uh, managed discomfort that enabled me to perform at a high enough level to get recruited and, and get scholarship offers to play in college. And then when I got to college, that's where I started getting exposed to successful businessmen and successful people who thought very differently from my parents, right? My dad is a very academic thinker, which I thought was the correct way to think until I started spending time with athletes and businessmen who don't think um, in a way that would be given a high grade by academia. A lot of people don't realize that. It's like, it's not a uh, coincidence that a lot of entrepreneurs are poor students. It's not random. It's that the education system actually teaches you to think in a way that is antithetical to success as an athlete and an entrepreneur. So the best athletes and entrepreneurs actually understand their reality in a way that will give them bad grades as students. And so I understood this and, and I would go, you know, I had a real major. I was an economics major. I mean, to the extent that that's real economics is kind of a fake major, but it's, it's like considered a more challenging major. And so we would have bankers or, you know, registered financial advisors coming in, talking to us. I started noticing that there's a lot easier ways to exist in life than just waking up, going to work at eight and coming back at six. I started noticing that people who look good, spoke well, and charismatic, you know, had red carpets rolled out in front of them and they, they didn't have to play by the same rules as everybody else. And so as a competitive athlete, you start to latch on to anywhere rules are applied asymmetrically. You want to figure out how can I get those rules applied to me asymmetrically in a way that benefits me? How can I get something that my competition doesn't have? And at 21, 22 years old, that was I got to be in shape, speak well, and wear a suit that fits me. And everybody will just do what I want them to do. And that kind of turned out to be true. The hypothesis, uh, you know, after I was working for the conspiracy theorists, I thought that uh, based on our understanding of financial markets, I thought the tech sector was going to do really well. Because in a low interest rate environment, a lot of these venture capital firms are going to be able to raise a lot of money and they're going to recycle that money into startups with questionable business prospects. But if you're trying to make money in a, as an entrepreneur, you want to be in an environment where venture capitalists are just throwing money at you without asking too many questions. 
And so I thought Silicon Valley was going to be a great place to, uh, to try that out. I didn't know anything about technology. I didn't even have a smartphone back in 2011. And uh, I just told myself, I'll figure out a way to talk my way into Google. I'm just going to get on campus. I'm going to wear a suit. I'm going to speak well. Everything that I, that I hypothesized in college, if you speak well with a good suit and you're in shape, they'll pay you money. And that turned out to be exactly true. Um, you know, I, I spent a couple months trying and failing to get the attention of Google recruiters through online form submissions, but I figured out how to get invited on campus by a Vanderbilt alum, and he connected me to some sales managers, and within 90 seconds, I basically talked my way into a job just like I had imagined, um, and I spent six years working at Google, continued to train every morning because I wanted the advantages of being in good shape. But it wasn't until about halfway through my six years at Google that I realized that there was actually a much easier way to train that I hadn't realized um, through most of my 20s. And so I started getting like way more ripped than I realized was possible. Like fat just started sh shedding from my body and, uh, and my workouts were getting easier. And so I thought to myself like, okay, well, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get as shredded as possible as long as it's not hard. Right. So that was all I told myself was I'll make, you know, I'll make any trade-offs as long as they're not hard. And so I'm just, I'm only going to do easy things. If they're easy, I'm going to do them. If they're hard, I'm not going to do them. And so I made like minor dietary adjustments, you know, eat lower sugar food, you know, like don't eat the amount of carbs you crave, but not more than that. Don't eat when you're not hungry, only eat when you're hungry. Always have protein available when you're hungry. So like very intuitive diet adjustments that didn't require that I starve or do anything complicated to like below 4% hydrostatic body fat. And, and it wasn't hard. And I wasn't doing all the things that people said you had to do to get that shredded. And, you know, after five or six years of Google, I'm thinking to myself, like, if there's any way I could actually impact the world, it's not going to be through like my job at Google. It's going to be through sharing what I've learned about diet and nutrition and training. And so when I, I left Google to join the crypto space because the markets were taking off. Um, in 2017. But once I got into crypto, I realized that I don't have much negotiating power as a sales rep in crypto if I don't have a social following because Twitter is such a, an important social network to the cryptocurrency space. And so I tried and failed to get a following in 2018, uh, decided to buckle down and actually follow a template that worked. So I bought Ed Lattimore's ebook. I applied those methods to my audience development in 2019 created an account that was solely focused on what I was doing for training. And, you know, it was basically posting 4,000 calories a day of delicious food and 4% body fat abs. And this is when everybody was doing intermittent fasting. It fits your macros and nobody could figure out like, how, how is this guy eating so much, not counting calories and looking like that. And so I kept posting and posting and posting. And by like my ninth month, I get messages in my box. Hey, where can I learn more? Where can I learn more? Where can I learn more? And so that's when I started launch, launching ebooks. I launched my first ebook, An Easy Wins for Easier Fat Loss, thinking, oh, you know, maybe I'll make 500 bucks on this. I don't expect to make that much money. If I just like make back what, you know, what, what I put in, it's, it's fine. And my first day, I sold $900 of wow. my ebook. And so I'm like, oh, wow. And I knew it's a launch sale. So it's not like I'm going to sell $900 of it every day. But like, I'm like, oh, wow, that's interesting. I can make money online. And then a couple months later, I launched my recipe book, same thing, did really well at the beginning. And then COVID hit and everything got locked down. And when everything got locked down, but I kept traveling, that's when I realized like, oh, actually, I don't need to wait for a launch to make money. I can, you know, I have a couple of different products available. I can run promotions on, you know, one or the other and, uh, you know, see if I can make money every day on it. And, you know, by July, 2020, was when I made my first $8,000 profit on a month that I didn't launch any new product, products. It was just, I'll just run sales and see how many eBooks people want to buy. I thought, oh, $8,000, that's not bad. That's actually close to the $10,000 that you wanted to make when you were starting out you know, doing this. Let me see if I can do it again. Did it again, August, 2020, another 8,000 uh, bucks. September, 2020, I made like 10,000 bucks, something about 25,000 bucks, 26,000 bucks and a quarter. That's not bad, let me see if I can do it again. Did it again, Q4 2020. And at that point, crypto markets had taken off. I had, uh, bought a good amount of Bitcoin in 2020. And so my net worth was up you know, several hundred thousand dollars. I had an online business that was doing $25,000 in profits. And I thought, okay, well, in 2020, 
Um, I, I'm going to move to Texas. Jay's in Texas. I'm, I'll meet some people in Texas, pay no income tax in Texas. It's a good place to scale my business. And all I've wanted to do since I started at Google is figure out how to run my own business so I wouldn't have to answer to a boss and go through what I consider a humiliation ritual of uh, performance reviews. And so, you know, since May of 2021, I've been doing this full time, you know, recently crossed $500,000 of lifetime Gumroad revenue, lifetime, you know, a couple, couple years ago, a couple of years ago. It's a big deal. Started. Yeah. So, and that leads me to the life that I live today, which is basically creating content, helping people out, lifting weights a lot, taking care of my body, eating delicious food. It's a dream life. You know, if we can keep doing this forever, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Man. What a story, man. Congrats on all of the success you. that you've, you've created, man. It's been really awesome to watch uh, from my perspective and just see you grow. And it's, it's just, it's crazy, man. Like, I feel like we've known each other for so long because we've both had so much experience in such a short period of time. You know what I mean? And yeah. it feels like, it feels like we've known each other for, for what more, way more than, than two years. I think we met officially like two years ago in, in Indy. Was it 2019 or was it 2020 when we met? 2020, right? We met, uh, we may have met late 2019, like either, briefly, because I went to e &D in September 2019. So we may have met there. I don't think I, I don't think I met you that period. I think, I think it was, oh, okay. I had a blown either way though, man, congrats. Um, super incredible. And so I'll share a little bit about my story too. So Alex, yeah. obviously incredible accolades, man. And I, and I'm excited that you shared all that because it just gives you that much more credibility. Like you have a reason to share all the things that you do. You're always talking right. shit. And there's a reason why you're always talking shit. Oh, you for sure. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know stuff, man. This, this guy's smart. He's really smart. So yeah, my journey began in small town, Ohio, really small town, one stoplight town. You know, I grew up in a really, really rural country area. And so that, you know, it breeds a lot of um, small town thoughts, right? Growing up in a cornfield, you know, you're not really introduced to a lot of different types of people, a lot of different types of ideas. And so at eight years old, as I mentioned earlier, went through some pretty serious trauma as a childhood that really shook my entire reality. It changed my entire life. And it sent me on this spiral of, um, of obsessive compulsive disorder. So I don't know if I've ever shared this with you, Alex, but that was really what it manifested into early on was OCD, where oh, yeah, at a young, on, okay, yeah. yeah, at a young age, yeah. like I, I, there'd be nights where I couldn't go to bed. I'd be up all night flipping light switches, dude. Yeah, I, couldn't yeah, yeah. Step, I couldn't step on cracks. I'd wash my hands hundreds of times a day, man. Like it was yeah. nuts. And the fear was that if I didn't go through these compulsions, something bad would happen to someone I love, specifically like my parents, because I love my parents the most at that point in my life. And so it was terrible, you know? And so I spent most of my childhood with really strong, aggressive OCD and also really intense social anxiety. So throughout middle school, high school, I was terrified of everyone. You know what I mean? Like I was just scared. I was, man, if I had if I had to give a presentation in front of the class, like that was my worst nightmare. But even in just being in the hallways, like walking through the hallways, I remember feeling like crazy anxiety within my, within my soul, man, within deep within my being. And so I didn't really, throughout middle school, I was an athlete, you know, I was doing all the sports. I was one of the cool kids, but like, I didn't really hang out outside of school with anyone. You know what I mean? I, I really just did my own thing. I hung out at home and just was depressed basically as yeah. sad as that is. And so then I go into high school and in high school, I'm a one sport athlete. I did ran track my entire high school career. I love track. I used to hate distance running, which is ironic because now I'm doing Ironman and endurance training, but I did singularly sprint events. I only sprinted. My mom was the coach of the men's varsity track team at my high school since I was a little kid. So I grew up around track my entire life. I spent a lot of time as a kid around those high school kids, which was cool. Like looking up to those guys, they were, they were heroes. And so I go throughout high school and my, my belief in myself started early on. When you asked me that question earlier, it reminded me of when I was a junior in high school, I wanted to be a really elite level hurdler. And I believe I had the potential to do so, but I had crippling shin splints. And so I couldn't practice my junior and senior year of high school track. I could only run in the uh, meets. I would show up to the meets and run, but I couldn't practice. I couldn't condition myself. I couldn't practice hurdles because of how debilitating my shin splints were. So that kind of took that goal away from me. I couldn't, you know, there was no chance of me achieving that without being able to practice, obviously. Um, and so I started lifting weights at 16. And that was when my journey really changed. 16 years old, I find the gym, which I became obsessed with right away. I was, a, I was a string bean. You know what I mean? I had no muscle. I was just a small little kid. And initially my, my goal was just to have abs. Like that's why I started training initially. Cause I wanted to have abs. You know what I mean? And I thought if I got abs, I would get girls and I would get all the other, yeah. you know what I mean? That was the thought process. And so I literally, I started with at 16, the insanity program, 
And I would, nice. run, I would run, I would run two miles down the road, one mile down, one mile back. I'd come back to my basement. I'd do the insanity program, which dude, so hard. It would still be hard today. And then I would do like a bunch of core work. And so that's how I started training. And then I went to the gym at 16 shortly after one of my track coaches invited me in that summer, fell in love right away. And that same year, because I started going to the gym, the kid I hurdled with, his dad was a really old school bodybuilder. He trained at this gym called old school gym in Ohio, which was like 20 minutes away. So he invites me one day that summer, I go with him, see this MP sign on the wall. And I was like, man, what is that? And so long story short, eventually I found out it was a company called Muscle Farm and they had just started. The company had just been founded about a year prior. And I found out that the co founder of the gym was also the co-founder of this company called Muscle Farm, which was like the UFC's biggest sponsor at that time. They were in the middle of the UFC, Matt, like they were a big deal and they were growing quickly. And so I meet this guy, Corey, and he's got like at the time, dude, back in 2010, 2011, he had like 15,000 followers on Twitter, which was a big deal at that time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I was like, wow, like this guy's, he's incredible. And so something deep within me was like, man, you got to build a relationship with this guy, something about him. There's something that's going to come from this you got to build a relationship with him. And so I started making sacrifices at a young age, showing up to the gym every day at 5 a.m. at 17 years old to train with this guy because that's when he trained. It was a whole 5 a.m. crew thing. You know what I mean? Every day I had to get up early and go train before school. And so long story short, I start training with this guy, start building a relationship with this guy. And he starts to introduce me to personal development, right? I mean, this guy was worth millions of dollars. He was a really successful guy. He was connected with lots of athletes at the time. And I'm like, man, I want to, I want to be like this guy. So it's like, what are you doing to get like this? So he shares with me a couple of different books, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which was the first book I ever read by Robert Kiyosaki, um, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, a lot of Napoleon Hill books early on at 16, 17, that really started to shape my mindset because growing up in a small town, I didn't have that kind of stuff. I didn't have access to that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, my mom's a school teacher. My dad builds houses. He owns a custom home building company. So entrepreneurial, but it wasn't like that. You know what I mean? And so this was groundbreaking for me among also finding Joe Rogan podcast in 2010 totally divine, man. I don't know how I discovered this podcast, but no one even knew what a podcast was in 2010. You know what I mean? But I, and I somehow stumbled upon the podcast of all podcasts, Joe Rogan podcast at, at, at 16. And so between these two guys, like my entire life changed. And I realized I mentioned earlier, all that pain, all that, that, that hurt I had gone through could be turned into purpose. And if I could conquer what I was going through, I could help so many other thousands and millions of people eventually do the same thing. I could help other people heal because I knew so many other people must be hurt too. And so I go on this path of, of self-growth. I start reading all these different books at 17, 18. At 18 years old, I decided to go to college because I thought that's what I was supposed to do, right? Like you go to college, you get your degree and you go get a comfortable job and you work until you're 65, you retire. And then you have your dream life. You're in heaven for, you know, however many years you live and then you die. And like, I, I was bought into that. And so I start going to Ohio State at the time. And at that time, as I mentioned earlier, like my anxiety was sky high, man. I couldn't go to class without having a full-blown panic attack. And so at 18 was an interesting time because I started antidepressants at 18. Mm. And I also started smoking weed at 18 as well at the same time, which was not a good combo. And I spent three years both going to Ohio State full time, somehow getting decent grades in college, which I'll get to just totally in a, in a daze all the time. And also working at this company, Muscle Farm, part time initially, and I eventually got to full time. But between antidepressants and marijuana, I lived in this chronic state of cloudiness. Mm -hmm. Really impossible to describe, man. Like it was such a, a cloudy state. My entire reality was it was it was it was very different. It was it was it was weird, man. And I hated it. I felt like a zombie all the time. I I couldn't mm -hmm. feel really. I couldn't feel good. I couldn't feel bad. I just was kind of just there. It wasn't necessarily just because the an it was the antidepressants. It was because of the weed too. Because I was high all day every day at that time. I was just trying to not feel what I was feeling. You know right. what I mean? And so I spent three years that way. And I was so it, three years later, I'm still at Ohio State. I'm still working for this company, Muscle Farm. I'm learning a ton. I'm growing, but I'm still on antidepressants. And I'm like, this isn't it. Like, I know that this isn't the long-term solution. And so I decided to wean myself off, which probably isn't a good idea. I didn't seek the doc doctor's guidance. I was like, I got to get off this stuff. So I gradually weaned off over, I don't know, maybe two months. And I'm telling you what, man, it was such a weird process. Like there were withdrawal symptoms and I, and I did it by the book. Like I looked it up online and like, okay, this is how you can wean off. I would have these crazy nervous system jolts while I was weaning off for, for months where my entire body would, would zap. I would have this like zap through my whole body because of those withdrawals from the antidepressants. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you something else too, maybe TMI for everyone. But when I was on the antidepressants, I could get a boner, but I couldn't orgasm. I couldn't orgasm on the antidepressants unless I was high on marijuana. <laughs> okay. And so these antidepressants, yeah, yeah, these antidepressants were not good. Like I just knew. And so I get off the antidepressants. Could you I'm pee? Hold, hold, could you pee when you were high 
on the antidepressants? <laughs> what do you mean? No, no, no. So, well, no okay, so, I'm asking this because I had no, 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 I, Listen, listen, listen. I'll, so the I'll, antidepressants, the antidepressants I was on, they weren't like Xanax where you take it and you're, you're feeling it first. It was a long term. I took one in the morning and one at night. And it was like yeah. a steady, a steady thing where it wasn't like a Xanax where you feel like, whoa, like I'm on Xanax. It's kind of just a, a it's your reality. You know what I mean? And so I would pee like normal. So all my peas were normal. Uh, I ask, I have, I'll, I'll, I'll tell the story when you're done because there's a story about <laughs> me and not being able to pee properly. And, and Got I'll, it. I'll explain why I was connecting dots that way. It'll make a lot of sense. But, okay, so so at 21, so three years later, I'm getting off the antidepressants. I'm still going to Ohio State full time. I, I don't really even know why I'm going to Ohio State. I was, I was exercise science, but I, I wasn't, you know, I just wasn't bought in. And so eventually in 2015, I decided that it's a good idea to drop out. And so I present that to my parents. I had already decided, but I, I run that by my parents. And my dad was like, I don't think that's a good idea at all. You know what I mean? Like, why would you do that? My mom was kind of indifferent. And this was a good moment for me to, to realize that, like, no one believes in me like me. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and, and it didn't matter if anyone believed in me like me because it, it's, it's my life. You know what I mean? And so I told my parents, I said, well, you don't have to believe me. I'll just show you through, through results and through action. I can't try to convince you of anything, but just trust me. Mm-hmm. And so literally four months later, I'm working at this company, Muscle Farm, which was my dream job at the time. I thought I was going to be an executive there one day because of my mentor being the co-founder. And like, I had a, I had a, you know, path to the top and I'd been working there for a couple of years at that point. Well, it's a publicly traded company. My mentor, the co-founder, his business partner basically decided to sell all the shares. Somebody came in, bought majority share, which meant they, they owned the vote of the board. And so they came in and basically cut everyone from the company because the company was going downhill. Like they were bringing in crazy revenue, but they're, they just didn't build it correctly. They went from a $14 stock to now being worth pennies. <laughs> it, it, it hit the, it, it hit the fan completely, but this guy comes in and basically cuts us all. So I get a call from my mentor one day. Hey, nothing I could do about this. I'm so sorry. It was really emotional, but like everyone's laid off. Yeah. So now here I am. I just dropped out of college three, four months earlier. Now I don't have a job, which I had thought I had the secure job, you know, back in 2015, yeah. I got the secure job. I'm going to work here for years. I had just bought a piece of property and was about to build a new house. My dad was going to build me a house as an investment property and everything comes crashing down. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, okay, well, what am I going to do now? Right. And so I decided to go into real estate as a realtor. I don't even know if you know this about me. I went into real yeah, estate as a realtor. Really? Yeah, very, very short period of time for about six months. I sell my parents' house as an alley oop. I make like eight thousand dollars, put that in the bank, sell one of my older teachers' houses. I only houses make eight thousand bucks selling a house. I bet you make you well it depends six, on how much the house is. What's it's, so okay, so here's how it works. It's six percent comes out of the seller's um it's three money. and three, huh? Three, three and three, but then you gotta pay your broker. You gotta pay your broker. And so they take um, a fraction of a percent as well. So you end up with like two point two five, I think, depending on where you're at in in the contract. And so um, I pocket that. I pocket the money from the other sale. And I'm just hanging out smoking weed all day at that point. Just like, not sure what I want to do. I got money set aside. I got a severance from the company Muscle Farm too. So I'm just chilling. What but I'm not happy. Did give you? I think it was like two months of pay or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, and so I'm just chilling and I'm not happy though. I'm very depressed at this time. Like my depression is still very, very frequent. And I'm not on antidepressants anymore. I'm not depressed like I used to be, but I'm still not very in a good place. And so long story short, I find myself reading this book, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, which is my favorite book of all time. This book I've read probably 15 times. The pages are literally like yellow at this point. And I read this excerpt at the end of the book that says, if you were the last person on earth, would you still do it? And so I pose that to what I'm doing career-wise at that point. And I'm like, well, if I'm the last person on earth, of course, no one's going to be selling or flipping houses or anything like that. But I realized that wasn't my passion. And so in that moment, I'm sitting on the bathroom floor. I love reading in the bathroom with the fan going. It's my favorite place, dude. It's so calm. I'm at my parents' house at that time, 2015. And it was such a divine moment. And so I asked myself, well, if you were the last person on earth, what would you still be doing? I'd be lifting weights and I'd be developing my mind and and, and soul. I'd be developing mind, body, soul. Okay, well, how can I make that my full-time thing? And I was like, well, my mentor had left that muscle farm company at this point and was using his brand, which he had a pretty big following on social media to build a subscription based website and some other stuff that he was making hundreds of thousands of dollars a month on. Like I've been around this guy for years. I've seen him build his brand. Like I can do this. All I got to do is take action and start building a brand. Right. It wasn't as, it wasn't as saturated at that time either. Just, you know, social media. And I already had a thousand followers on Instagram, maybe in like a thousand on Twitter, five, whatever it was from, from exposure from that mentor. And so I decide in that moment, okay, well, 
I'm going to go this path. So what's in my way? What's stopping me from doing that? The only thing that was in my way was my fear of being on camera, my fear of, of, of social situations. Okay. What's something I can do to get over that right now? I dropped everything. I drove to Best Buy. I picked up a tripod because my mom had an iPad at home. So I pick up a tripod for the iPad. I go back home. I got this big ass whiteboard, like eight feet long. It's massive that I got from the muscle farm company. I set it up. This is still on my YouTube, by the way, my first YouTube video ever. It's so bad. I set it up by the pond, set up the tripod, set up the whiteboard, write a bunch of scribble on it. And I record like a 10 minute video of me just rambling, dude, about who knows what personal development stuff. That was the first step. From that point, every single day forward, I recorded a video at the gym and put it on Instagram. Start gaining traction right away. My mentor starts getting me exposure. I start a YouTube show with him and it all starts to grow. And I'm on the phone with Zach now because Zach Hummel comes into play with all this. He worked at Muscle Farm the whole time as well as a sales rep in Indianapolis. He got laid off shortly after I did. Started Iron Valley Barbell, started iron, um, online coaching. And so at this point, I've started building my brand and I'm telling Zach like, man, it's going really well. I think in the next couple of months, I'm going to start offering online coaching and start this online business. And he's like, the fuck? Why would you wait a couple of months, dude? Do it right now. Yeah, I guess that's a great idea. So that night, I made a post on Instagram saying I was offering, there wasn't even Instagram stories at that time. It was just on my, on my actual page that I'm offering online coaching, get a couple of applications. And the first night I get my first paying client, you know, maybe it was like 200 something dollars or whatever it was, but I was in, I was sold right away. And so from that point, I go all in and I start posting again, every single day on Instagram, start bringing clients in. And at this point I've built a new house. I've got an investment property in Ohio that I'm living in as well. I'm trying to pay rent. I got some roommates as well. I spend a couple years there, 2017, 2016, Zach and I started a podcast um, called the initially the Young and Hungry Firecast, which I'm sure some of the listeners will recall. And then we did that for a year and a half through Zoom until in 2017, which is just a whole nother story. I had this divine moment with Zach after one of our podcasts, after the 68th episode that we had recorded through Zoom. He's like, how are you, man? And I'm like, not doing well, man. From the outside in, my life's incredible. Like I'm self-employed. I've got pretty decent money I'm making right now. I got a brand new house. I'm living the life, but I'm incredibly unhappy. I'm like, I'm crying on the way home from the gym at times. You know, my drive home in the morning, sometimes I'd be crying because like, I was so unhappy. And he had just started IVB about a year prior and was really building that. We had built our podcast up. And he's like, dude, you should move to India and come work with me. Like, why not? And right away, dude, I knew like right in my heart and soul. Like, as soon as he asked, I was like, whoa, like I should move to India, man. And so long story short, I spent a couple of days thinking about it. And I'm like, well, if I do this, there's this whole turmoil and situation going on between my first mentor and between Zach. And so it's like this mm -hmm. whole thing. And so I'm like, well, if I move to Indy, I know that this relationship over here is going to be over. Right. And mm -hmm. so, but I knew deep in my soul that I needed to move to Indy. So I spent a month on it. Eventually I decided to move to Indianapolis because it made so much sense. Zach's just such a good dude. He's my best friend at that point. We got the podcast together. He's got IVB. He's a younger guy. My mentor is older. And my mentor at the time, I just like wasn't happy about the way he was handling business and had screwed over Zach. And that's a whole different story. So I make the move, right? And I spent three years in Indianapolis developing my mind, body, soul. I learned so much from Zach in the gym. That guy's a fucking, you know, a guru. Mm -hmm. The best in the world, I believe, is understanding of, of training. So I spent three years getting to train with one of the highest level strength athletes in the world and also learn from him to apply to my own coaching and knowledge. And so my body developed so much over those three years. And my goal eventually in 2019 at that point was to become a pro physique competitor to become a pro strongman and to become an elite powerlifter. And I was well on my way. I was about 12 to 18 months out from doing all three of those things, I believe. And that was my entire life at that point. I'm developing my online coaching business still along the way. And in 2020, we're getting close now to present day. 2020, the year began. Well, let me share this actually real quick. End of 2019, I go to the jungle. I do ayahuasca, which is again, a whole separate story. I won't dive too much into. That's a great conversation itself. But 2019, I go to the jungle finally for the first time. Do ayahuasca had the most life-changing week of my entire life. I come back to Indianapolis on fire, just vibing, just like happy about life. I release so much trauma, so much hurt and go back to Indy, go back to Costa Rica again for a second time, February of 2020. Again, another healing, incredible experience. It's just like so much growth. Go back home. A week later, I blow my knee out, right? Knee explodes at this point. I, and I knew in the moment, like my kneecap ended up on the side of my leg. And then with my leg completely bent like this, your, your kneecap shouldn't move. I, I jam it back in and I shred everything. It is bad. And I, so in the moment, I know I'm laying in the snow, excruciating pain. I know my training's derailed for a long time. And so in that moment, I have an opportunity to go from victim mindset, which is where I was, to gratitude. This must be happening for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I get carted out of the woods on a four-wheeler crying, saying literally verbally, thank you to, the, to God, to the whatever. Thank you. Thank you. And so... 
then COVID starts. I spent all of 2020 launching a new business, a high ticket coaching model for entrepreneurs, grow the business throughout 2020, start rehabbing my leg. End of 2020, moved to Austin, Texas, which Alex Feinberg, of course, lives here now too. We're both Austin inhabitants. So I moved to Austin end of um, 2020 to pursue more growth, some new mentorship here, just a great community and, and, and environment to be in. Um, 2021, spend developing this company, Entreperform, which as Alex and I had talked about before, like I was telling Alex, like this is going to be a hundred million dollar company, which I fully believed and I believe we could have gotten there. But long story short, in 2021, I realized after a year and a half, this isn't for me. Like I was very CEO role. I had really lost my roots, like working with the clients hands on being in nature just wasn't me. I had this idea and vision of what I wanted to create, but it wasn't really what I wanted to create. It was society and some of the other people I had around me, what they thought was what they wanted. And so I pivot, I leave the company, two weeks of hard conversation after hard conversation. I get a whole nother story. And that leads then to 2022. Coming into 2022, I'm finally fully back to myself of not having a whole team. I had a whole team of employees at this company. I was like, I shed all the weight and was back to 100% just one man show. Coming to 2022 with huge goals, decided to do an Ironman in 2022, which was my biggest fear because I was terrified of swimming. I also was absolutely terrified of public speaking, decided 2022 is the year I delivered my first keynote and, and get into public speaking. I delivered the keynote in August, absolutely crushed it. Alex was there, 10 out of 10 grand slam, huge confidence yeah. booster. Now I'm, I'm a month and a half out from this Ironman. I've developed so much confidence and personal power through this Ironman this year. And to bring it all full circle, and, and I hate talking about myself, but sometimes it's nice. So thanks everyone for listening and, and giving me the space. Now I'm hosting ayahuasca retreats full time in the jungle. It, it's unbelievable how how that's all built up. It's the perfect funnel into all my other coaching. Business is so easy for me at this point. I'm able to make exponentially more money, have exponentially more impact than I have in the previous six years, working quite a bit less, doing exactly what I want to do. And now focus almost full time on my Ironman training. I want to be a pro Ironman competitor in the next 12, 24 months and continue to build out the keynote speaking and... I'm pumped to be here. I'm really excited about this podcast, Alex. Again, thanks for letting me share a little bit about myself. I, I, uh, I don't know. It feels weird to share about yourself. That's great. I mean, I think the moral of the story, listening to you and also listening to some of the things that, that I've talked through, is if you can turn negatives into positives, you can't stop growing, right? Like you can't you just lose. Keep going forward. You either go a little bit forward or a lot forward. You just figure out a way to turn negatives into positives. Your life will always get better. You um, refuse to lose. Yeah. I think that that uh, probably makes sense to wrap for episode one. Uh, that was great, Jay. Thanks for uh, for making this happen and suggesting it. Uh, for, for folks listening, uh, stay tuned for our next episode, probably coming out in about a week or so. I'll try to do these uh, nearly weekly, though I can't I'll imagine that we'll miss a week here or there. Um, thanks for tuning in episode one. Stay tuned for episode two.